You came on a very interesting time. Generally, the country is, I think, going through a lot. What's the perception from outside? I'd say that Pakistan is one of the most exciting large countries in the region because there's tremendous enthusiasm. You talked about your kids. So when you talk to them about that you are working in Meta, like how do they see it? And did you get a lot of requests of, I don't know, like verifications or monetizations? <laughs> or? And so actually they were pretty, they were more excited about coming into the office. Uh, one thing about tech companies is they're pretty generous in terms of the free food and drink. How you guys are working with the creators because the creator economy as we discuss is quite huge. There is a lot of growth which we have seen. We really try to improve connectivity so that creators here in Pakistan can reach not only people here but reach people around the world. So I'm happy to, happy to let you know that we are connecting a cable uh, early next year to Karachi which is 45,000 kilometers long which will connect Pakistan with 33 other countries. What's stopping Meta to bring monetization to Pakistan? How much time do you spend on Meta? <laughs> wow. It's an interesting one because I I mean I'm using products kind of all day every day in, in many ways. The WhatsApp is my by far the product I use more than anything else. What is public policy have to do with a platform where we just go and spend time and watch videos? Wow, that is a big question. Talk to me a little bit about working with Meta. I did have somebody who said to me, how is a guy as old as you going to cope with a company as young as this? That's just not the case anymore. From my personal perspective, I, it's been an incredible company to join. I think one of the questions, especially from the creator economy, if they're watching, how how to go viral on social media? That's maybe the $64 million question really as to what is the kind of content. Look. Hi everyone, welcome to a very special episode. Today we have Simon Milner with Meta, who is the Vice President and looks at public policy in the APAC region. Today we are going to do a very interesting question with them. A very big question is, what is Meta in Pakistan? What projects are going on? What is the collaboration with the government? And what are the most interesting new features and products that are coming in the market? Simon, thank you so much for taking the time out. Talk to me a little bit about your experience in Pakistan right now. Is this your first trip, I, I believe? No, it's not actually. It's my okay. second trip. Uh, but since the first one was before the pandemic, it feels like the first time uh, because that just the, the, that, that passage of time uh, over COVID was so dramatic. And so it's great to be back uh, here in Islamabad. I love coming here. Uh, I think the people are incredibly welcoming. It's f it's a fascinating country. Uh, I'm only seeing a small glimpse of it, um, but it, I I really have enjoyed my my time here. This you also came on a very interesting, I think, uh, time when there's a lot of like political stuff happening, and and uh, generally the country is I think going through a lot. What's the perception uh, from outside when when you look at Pakistan? So when I think about it, I'm responsible for the whole Asia Pacific region. So there's enormous amounts of diversity, some, some very large countries like Pakistan with places like Indonesia and Bangladesh, I'm also responsible for. And then obviously some very small countries, huge levels of diversity in terms of um, how much tech policy activity there is uh, and diversity in terms of the digital economies. I'd say that Pakistan is one of the most exciting large countries uh, in the region because there's tremendous enthusiasm for our products here uh, from people, uh, from small businesses, uh, from communities, also from developers, really strong developer community. On the policy side, which I'm responsible for, Frankly, there's a bit of a mixed picture. Uh, there are some aspects of our uh, dialogue, including the conversations I've had this week, which is very encouraging. This is a government that wants a, a healthy digital economy, but also there are areas of policy which are concerning. And uh, so moves that, frankly, I think would put, potentially put Pakistan back uh, on, that, on, that, um, uh, on that road to a really strong, healthy, vibrant digital economy, which is open to the world. So it's a bit of a mixed picture, I'd say, and that's not uncommon. There are other countries in the, uh, in the region that are like that. And um, our role really is to try and work with everybody involved, and obviously for my responsibility, especially government, to help ensure they make well-informed decisions, uh, where, which we think will enable Pakistan to continue to grow and to thrive. Before we go into uh, more of your work with the government, or like generally 
Talk to me a little bit about your own background because working with uh, Meta, it's like a very, like a youth sort of focused organization. W- what was your sort of personal journey for the last like, you know, like two, two, three decades? Okay, so I have a bit of a funny story about this one. I was applying to join the company and being interviewed. Uh, This is way back in 2011, so 13 years ago, um, probably around this time. In Meta, you mean? uh, To join the company, uh, being interviewed. Uh, I did have somebody who said to me then, how is a guy as old as you going to cope with a company as young as this? Now, that was kind of a little bit in jest, but it was a sense of this is a very young company, uh, and the sense of everybody who worked here was young, and it was principally aimed at young people. That's just not the case anymore. Um, you know, this is a company that's just creating products for everybody. Uh, and yes, young people are important, and clearly they are the future, literally. Um, but everybody matters when it comes to our services. And when, we, the, when you're a company with 3.2 billion people around the world using your products, that's every age from 13 upwards uh, are using our products. So we're here for everyone. Uh, from my personal perspective, I, it's been an incredible company to join. Uh, I was uh, I previously worked at the BBC, and I thought when I left the BBC, I will never work for a more important company in my life. Uh, now I've worked here for almost 13 years. That's not true. I do think that Facebook Meta has more impact on more people's lives in more countries around the world than any uh, media organization has ever done and will ever do uh, because of what we enable people to do uh, for themselves and with their in their communities uh, and the way that we enable people to connect. And w- w- what did you study at, um, in your bachelor's and master's? Oh, well, so that's a, that's a real throwback. So I did history and economics at Oxford. Uh, and then I actually studied industrial relations um, uh, at the London School of Economics. And I did a, in fact, I did a PhD uh, in that topic and was all set to be an academic. Uh, but actually, I found as much as I enjoyed uh, research, uh, I really wanted to get involved in the world of policy because I felt that was more impactful for people's lives. And I was just intrigued by it. And I've now worked for three big organizations, the BBC, BT, which is a big British uh, telecoms company, in fact, literally called British Telecom, um, and now Facebook uh, Meta. And uh, honestly, I've never once felt to myself, I'd like to go back and be an academic. Uh, I, I love what I do. I love being able to represent this company, to engage with people in hugely diverse settings, including here in Pakistan, and and to talk about the things that they care about when it comes to technology, when it comes to our products, and the policy issues that create. And when you were growing up at that time, uh, because the landscape was very different, um, at least in Pakistan right now, it's either it's engineering or you need to go into, uh, you know, the medical, most of it. Uh, when you were growing up, what was the atmosphere around you? And, and that then led to the policy sort of world. Well, remember, I am, I'm old, right? Uh, and so when I was growing up, most people didn't go to university. It was pretty uncommon. So I've got two sisters. Neither of them uh, went to university. I was the first person to do that in my family. Thankfully, now I've got three grown-up children all in their 20s. They all went to university, and that's quite common. Uh, and they've all done quite different things um, from me. And I, I think that the world of policy is one in which, rather like the world of politics, uh, you actually really want to have people with a real a range of experiences. Uh, in general, I don't encourage. I've got one son who's finishing university soon who's studying politics. Politics. I'm not encouraging him to go into politics. I think actually the policy and political world benefits from people who have had different experiences as lawyers, as doctors, as journalists, who've worked in industry, uh, who've done all kinds of different things, or maybe haven't actually done a profession, uh, are coming from a, a, if you like, a, a background of somebody who's been a homemaker. I think that's good for the for, for running countries well and for making decisions because these are people who understand what's going on in real people's lives. And I think that's also good for companies like ours to have a diversity of people who do all kinds of different jobs in our in our company, including in the policy. And when you talk to your, you talked about your kids. So when you talk to them about that you are working in Meta, like how do they see it? And did you get a lot of requests of, I don't know, like verifications or monetizations <laughs> or things like uh, that? Well, look, my I, because I my kids were 
young when I started, only one of them had a Facebook account um, uh, when I first started in the company. And so actually they were pretty, they were more excited about coming into the office. Uh, one thing about tech companies is they're pretty generous in terms of the free food and drink uh, that we provide for employees. And we encourage people to come in and, and explore our, our, our spaces to bring their families in. So I did have one time with my son who was probably eight at the time, coming in and we had to frisk him on the way out because he put so many sweets or candy all over his body. <laughs> we had to frisk him and kind of say, look, you can't take that much home with you. Um, so he's now 22. And in fact, he's um, he and some friends are driving across, the, across from London to Mongolia. So I was messaging him with him a couple of days ago. He's in Armenia at the moment. So he and I are actually much closer together uh, than we normally are between Singapore and Edinburgh, where he's studying. He's now in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. I'm in Islamabad. I mean, it's pretty hard to get between the two places, but uh, we're closer than we usually are together. So that, but just going back to your question, uh, they were pretty excited um, uh, about a dad joining a, a tech company, an American tech company, having worked for two British com big British brands before. Uh, they were intrigued as to wh what it was all about. They were very excited when I was able to take them to uh, our headquarters in Menlo Park and, and to explore that. So yeah, they're, they're pretty, uh, I think they're still pretty proud of dad for having come and, and doing this. And now in particular, they love the fact that I, I moved halfway around the world and um, I get to come uh, to places like uh, Pakistan, uh, to Islamabad, and, and you know do calls with them, share with them how people are using our, our products, and also what goes on here, hmm. uh, what's life like uh, in in Islamabad, and just to get them excited, I think, about traveling the world and exploring. Talk to me a little bit about like Meta overall, um, because as like if you're a normal person, you think about it's a platform where you go upload pictures and things like that. And in your whole conversation, you talked about products, you talk, talk about public policy even. So if like an average human is watching this, they'll be like, what is like public policy have to do with a platform where we just go and spend time and watch videos and the whole evolution of uh, Facebook, you know, starting with uh, the university for, for university students and then from there, like mainly for the friends and family and then focusing on news and then, OK, like no focus on news and then AI and then things like that. So how is the journey of like meta overall? Wow, that is a big question. I love that kind of question of how do you explain why Meta even needs a policy team, uh, let alone what do we actually do? Um, I, I, I'd say it's because there are a number of kind of aspects to it. But and initially it started really with politicians wanting to understand what is this product that millions of people are using in my country and should I be using it? So quite a lot of the early conversations when we first started building a policy team, which was probably around 2008, so a long time ago, um, was to just help people understand it. And indeed, that's still part of our job as a policy team is when, when policymakers, whether it's in government or regulators, uh, or, uh, want to understand our company, it's our job to do that. It's help explain it. It's almost like we're the ambassadors. So just as Pakistan has ambassadors and diplomats around the world, to help foreign governments understand Pakistan, understand not just its people, its uh, its policies, its um, its industries, all those things. That's what, that's what we do, right? We, that's we the easiest definition I've ever well, got. That, that's really. But then good. the other side of it is a recognition that um, a we people may be worried about our power um, because uh, there's never been there's never been anything like this as a place where people can express themselves. Uh, and that's everything from a journalist like yourself, a policymaker that's used to having airtime, if you like, and explaining themselves, a business leader perhaps. But now everybody has airtime. Anybody can go online and share their perspectives on what's going on around them, in their community, in the country, internationally, on an issue that they really care about, like say climate change, which is obviously hugely important here in Pakistan. Um, and that can get around the world very easily for free. Uh, and so that power, the power of the medium, is something that always interests policymakers, just in the same way as policymakers are very interested in the media. 
Well, you're a journalist, you know this. Uh, when you go and interview a uh, politician, I'm sure they're really, that they know that you are able to reach people uh, through your podcast and through your media that, uh, that they can't directly. And so, so there's that sense of power. And then I just want to be honest, there's also a sense of, well, look, when you have 3.2 billion people using products, not all of those people want to use it for good. The vast majority do, the vast majority. But there are some people who want to propagate harm, either by through incitement, for instance, or through crime. Uh, they're actually trying to engage with someone in order to defraud them. And so governments are rightly concerned about, well, what are you doing, Meta, to keep people safe, um, to manage those issues? How do you work with law enforcement, for instance, if there is criminal activity? So there's all kinds of different things that have developed over the years in terms of the work that we do. Um, uh, I'd say that still the, in this region, the great majority of it is about harnessing that excitement about what these products and services can do for people, for whether it's a female entrepreneur during COVID. And we had a, a, a massive rise in female entrepreneurship from people's homes during COVID because people could not go out to work, but built, you know, creating businesses at home, using Facebook to reach consumers, um, to people in, in education who want to think, how could I use this? So a lot of our work is what we call programs, where we partner with different organizations to enable people to make the most of um, these products and services, and including here in, in Pakistan. And also, like, how do you guys, obviously, I'm sure there is a team who looks into insights or into a long term strategy, okay, we need to focus on this, like the climate change, or as an example, the reels are now trending or like shots and things like that. But there is a criticism which we sometimes hear that as an example, if I am a news organization and I started my business mainly on Facebook, which is actually true, like TCM started from a very small page uh, on, on Facebook. So how do you like sort of uh, define what's needed and what's what's coming? Well, frankly, like every um, every company which is reliant on people getting value from products, it's to do with consumer preferences. So uh, yes, there was a period when we felt that um, by partnering with news organizations, uh, including in some cases actually funding um, the production of, of extra additional content, that that would be very, that people would really value that. Um, uh, it, as part of their Facebook experience in particular, particularly on Facebook, is less so with Instagram. Uh, frankly, we found that we weren't right. It, it didn't, people did not value it. Uh, people generally, uh, such a very small proportion of people's content in newsfeed. I know it's called newsfeed, which might imply news, but actually just that's just a term of art. It's a feed. Um, uh, the, a very small percentage, less than 5%, of uh, content in newsfeed was news. We're focusing on, on other things and a whole realm of other kinds of creators. So before we go into the creator economy, because sure. I feel like people would be, I think, more interested in that, but talk to me a little bit about uh, your presence in Pakistan. Mm. Like uh, for how, I'm sh like I know, like you don't still have a proper office, mm. which uh, a lot of my colleagues complain a lot, we should have office, there is no one to contact, but obviously you have a team in Singapore where yeah. you know people go and talk to them. But as in whole, what are some of the projects or like some of the, some of the partners as well uh, in Pakistan, which you guys have? Well, so we have about 60 million people using Facebook uh, here, and that's obviously a pretty high proportion of the people who are online. Um, you're right, we don't have an office, and, but that's true of many other countries uh, in, in this region and around the world where we have similar or probably more uh, users, and that's because our, this is an online service. Um, and in the same way that it's just as easy if you upload something here, any, any of your friends, wherever they are in the world, will see it at exactly the same time. Um, in the same way, our team, uh, we do have a dedicated team for Pakistan. They are based in Singapore, along with our dedicated teams for many other countries. They are in regular contact uh, with um, the government and uh, with partners here. And it, it makes no difference about the fact that they were based here. In fact, in some ways, it's much easier for them to do it from, from Singapore, given they're then a 
close by all the other colleagues that they need to work with. But going on to partnerships, look, just this week, we've uh, uh, the first event I was involved in uh, pretty soon after arriving in the country was uh, a really brilliant uh, event all around the use of AI, uh, where we'd just a few weeks ago, we kicked off um, this competition to ask for developers who, want, who were creating products for Pakistan using Llama, which is our open source um, uh, AI uh, model. Um, and we invited people to pitch uh, their idea. Um, either they're already using Llama or they plan to use Llama. We had 112 applic uh, applicants. We partnered with NICAT uh, and with Ignite and with the Ministry of IT uh, in this competition. So they helped us find uh, those, those people and encouraged people to apply. Uh, and then we had three finalists who pitched uh, this week, um, and uh, the and one the, the winner will go to Singapore uh, in a few weeks, um, alongside um, kind of the winners of a similar competitions in twelve other Asian countries, and stand to win a grant of a hundred thousand um, dollars. Now that now that couldn't happen without partnership. Um, we couldn't have done it on our own, uh, but and those partnerships, some of them are new, some of a long term, um, but it enables us to be able to reach more people uh, with our um, our programs in, in in Pakistan, and that's typical of what we do elsewhere in the world. But Pakistan was the first, uh, the first country we did this, and and that, a lot of that is to do with there's so much excitement and about why about AI and developers because of that because there's so much excitement here. We also launched, launched Meta AI. Uh, which is our own um, service built on Llama, uh, which is integrated into Instagram and WhatsApp and, and Messenger and Facebook. This is one of the few countries in Asia where we've launched it. And it's, all, and it's really popular. Um, so we're really happy with that. So it's partly, it's, it's really because we saw good partners, real excitement, a strong developer community uh, that we were able to make it happen here first. So really strong start for this. It's called the APAC AI Accelerator. Um, I, I'm delighted with it um, in terms of just how many applicants we had and how strong the winner is. Do you want me to tell you about the winner? Yeah, yeah I would love to know. So the winner is from a, um, a developer called, uh, I'm going to hope I get, I get this right, uh, Tran Transverse AI. But I can tell you about the product. The, the product is Urdu Llama. So this is, what they've done is taken Llama, they've added uh, their own uh, Urdu content to it, and they've created a product that can enable people who are not literate to be able to uh, speak into a device and create high quality, uh, high quality, you know, written Urdu, and to be able to send that as a text, but also to integrate to to ask questions of the Urdu Lama in their own language and to get answers back in their own language. Wow. So they're creating something which is going to be incredibly useful for tens of millions of, uh, of Urdu speakers here in Pakistan. Also talk to me a little bit about, uh, like if you talk about the partnerships, uh, I'm sure you're working with the government and on a political, let's say, scale, the fake news especially, uh, there are a lot of uh, blasphemy cases. There's a lot of like other similar stuff which is happening. And Facebook is like sort of a place where we see a lot of these things and you have a lot of programs to counter it. But with the Pakistani government or generally in Pakistan, like how are you thinking to sort of prevent that? And what are some of the work you guys are doing here? So there's a couple of different things. One is we have some long standing uh, education initiatives, uh, one called We Think Digital, uh, which is now uh, this year reached 45 million. Pakistanis with information about kind of appropriate behavior online and also what to do if they come across something which isn't, shouldn't be there and how to report it and how to get uh, that actioned. And, and we've got more to come on that front, more safety initiatives, and particularly some focused on young people and, and educating them about how to keep safe. Look, we also have, uh, and this is public knowledge, just like in other countries, which have particular rules around speech, we have a relationship with the authorities where they can alert us to content which they believe is locally legal and then we can review and act on that. And we report on that publicly um, in our transparency report, uh, which comes out a couple of times a year. So we, um, that's something we take seriously. We don't always agree. 
Uh, but in general, I'd say we've got a, we've established good working relationships uh, with the government. Indeed, that was part of my uh, meetings this week uh, with ministers was just to talk about that and in the context of some of the regulatory proposals that are under consideration uh, in, in the different ministries. And you talk about uh, working with the government. When, when you talk to them, what are they personally most interested in working with Meta? Uh, because again, in context to there's a problem in terms of the internet, generally the problem with the economy, generally there are a lot of like issues which, you know, like Pakistan is facing right now, uh, political instability, uh, economy is the biggest one. And such a big platform coming to them, like, are they interested in talking to you or is it just like, okay, you know, the company is coming, we just need to meet or do you feel like they're actually like into this or like fixing these things? I, I'd say all the meetings we've had have been very engaged. This is not something where this is not a nice to do or a, okay, some some senior persons from Meta is coming. Oh God, we better meet him, give him a cup of tea, whatever. No, they are. These are important meetings. They're serious. I'd say they're generally genial. This is not a case of well, we want to sit you down and give you a telling off. It's not like that. Uh, it's very much a look. Here are our, here are the issues we're concerned about. We're interested in security. We're interested in uh, safety, so real-world harm, um, particularly around, for instance, young people. We're interested in, we're worried about fraud and scams. I'd say these are the issues that every government's interested in. It's a principal thing that people look to government for is to keep them safe, uh, to protect them from criminals. Um, uh, and so that it's understandable that those are issues that the Pakistani government's concerned about, and so are we. Um, uh, then they're also interested in the development of the digital economy. So when I met with uh, Minister Shiaza from the Ministry of IT uh, this week, in fact, she was at this event uh, that we did earlier in the week. She was very excited about uh, AI uh, and the possibilities of what of how AI can be used actually to create new kinds of jobs uh, to enable, um, uh, you know, to, to unlock some inefficiencies uh, in the in the uh, in the in the economy, uh, and in some of the kind of bureaucracy, if you like, of of government. One of the other um, finalists in our competition ha is has uh, creating creating a product which will use AI to try to massively reduce the backlog of cases in the uh, Pakistan court system. Now, very very practical. Uh, when we were at the Ministry of Law, they were very interested in this. Uh, we we're making introductions uh, on that front. So, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're just getting started. So she was very interested in, in that, as were the other uh, people from NICAT and Ignite as well, about the, the sheer possibilities here. Uh, and these are benefits that not only can benefit Pakistan, but some of those developers are also getting interest from countries elsewhere in, in, you know, in this region and beyond um, for, for these exciting products. So I'd say there's both, um, if you like, some hard topics like security and safety. Uh, and then there's also what you might think of as warmer topics uh, around, um, uh, around the digital economy, around jobs, around youth and creators. One other thing, personally, I think, which I have seen, especially in the youngsters, um, I, I would say like the evolution of the young people, um, which includes hatred, which includes to so much like toxic sort of, you know, style of even talking to people. And one thing I feel like which I have noticed after the, the, the rise of digital, whether it's a TikTok or a YouTube or a Facebook or Instagram, before that, if you have any sort of thing, you, you know, go to someone and talk about it and you're very like sort of calm about it. And after these like platforms, one thing which you have seen, like people are very aggressive. There is a lot of like, you know, hate. Um, there's a lot of like, again, a blasphemy cases, like a fake news and things like that. Where do you see the role of the platforms? That's number one. And the second is the digital literacy is sort of also connected with that. And how to tackle that? Because the more the platforms, like the more they grow, the more this problem will, I think, arise. Um, and also the governments don't know how to tackle them. Yeah, I think this is a really important issue um, for all of us, both whether we've got, as it were, kids like I have. I've also got a couple of teenage uh, stepchildren 
who are just getting into the world of, of social media. So it's something that I know a lot of um, parents are worried about, but actually all of us should be uh, concerned about this. Um, uh, and I, I'm not sure I completely agree with you that it's definitely going to get worse. Uh, what we see, uh, I'll actually, let's just step back a bit. So I think on the one hand, there is education. And clearly one of the things that we need to do is make sure we uh, have the best kind of education material that is both disseminated through our services and that we use other platforms to do that, including broadcast uh, and partnering with government and partnering with other organizations to try and reach uh, young people and we've got a number of programs that we do around the world and then some specific ones for particular countries like Pakistan. The second thing is research. Uh, so uh, there's a, um, it's really important to actually understand what's really going on and not just to base it either on your own experience or maybe your perceptions of what's going on for, for younger people. So this general notion of that um, if, if a young person is feeling depressed or down, that, you know, social media is going to make it worse. Actually, there's lots of evidence to suggest, to suggest otherwise. That actually, especially, for instance, if you're someone who is struggling with, um, a, you know, what feels like just something that only matters to you, and, and, you, and there's nobody else in your family or among your school friends who's got the same problem, maybe you've got a particular kind of disability or you look a bit different from other people. Actually, when you go online, you can find people just like you who can also share about how they handle that situation. Maybe you're overweight as a child, as a young person. You can find a community of people who have, uh, you know, maybe also be overweight and, uh, and talk about how they handle uh, those kind of situations of teasing or bullying. So, and, and, a lot of, and so actually doing the research uh, is really important uh, to understand it. And then, and this is something that's absolutely our responsibility, is thinking about what can we do in terms of how the product works to try and address the issues that are, that are maybe not helped by the way people use our service. So one of the things we can do is say, let's for um, teenagers have screen time and say, we're going to make it easy to, or we're going to have reminders, for instance, that says, hey, you've been on Instagram for 45 minutes or you know, maybe two hours during the course of this day, it's time for a break. Uh, you know, we can also help parents with explaining to them how products like ours work. Um, we can help people in being able to, you know, kind of manage the comments that they might get on their uh, on their posts uh, to to block certain words, not just to block people, but block certain words that they might find, um, you know, painful for them. So the, there are a range of things that we can and do do. It, you, you're never going to fix it, you know, forever. You can't kind of flick a switch to make this just change. And that's like all complex uh, features of humanity, really. It, it takes multiple efforts and it takes partnerships. Um, but we, we believe, and, and I think it's also wrong to think all services are the same. There are clearly some products uh, that have not invested as much in this area um, that are interested in just keeping people addicted. Um, uh, that's not what we're about as a company. Uh, we, that's not good for us. It doesn't fit with our values. Uh, we know that's not what parents want. It's not what young people want. Um, and it's not what policymakers want. So we're, we, we, we do the research. We, we have partners who actually work with young people, often are young people, uh, to help us understand what works. And then we also talk to parents and we are constantly trying to improve. Uh, so, you know, frankly, we've got a whole range of things that we do now, but expect that to continue to develop in the years to come. Because I, I want you, I'd love for you to feel rather than to, you know, especially we can help you with this, to feel actually, I think I'm wrong. I don't think it's right to say this is inevitably bad or inevitably going to get worse. I just don't think. I mean, I personally feel like the, the polarization in the society, at least in Pakistan, has increased a lot. Right. And I feel like the overall, the presence of the digital, the rise of digital, I think help that um, and because there is no as such law like I know there yeah. is FIE and things like that but the process are not like you know as such there so generally you know in, in, in Pakistani society it's just like you know because of the political activism because of the religious activism whether it's uh, again the blasphemy cases uh, there are a lot of cases which we have seen uh, just happened on digital like I have sent you something 
you have sent me something back in my inbox account and you take that to somewhere and show people the images and things like that so generally i don't know uh, i also don't know what's the solution i feel like the only solution is the digital literacy because to the young people especially the gen z or the new generation which is like you know coming for the next 10 20 30 years you need to teach them how to use these tools better and just sort of teach them uh, yeah. because these platforms cannot go anywhere like obviously you know they, they will grow more and more so in pakistani context i think that's that's true well look you you know pakistan much better than me uh, so i i don't want to gain say that but i think also look it's a shared responsibility so we want to tap into your understanding in terms of what are you seeing and are there some things that we could be doing better are that do we need to tweak that do we need to change some of that education uh to adapt to be responsive to new developments in society um i mean one thing we do do for instance when when there is one thing we're particularly uh focused on is where um online kind of what some what you might sometimes call hot speech so when people are getting very agitated about something that that could be associated with real world harm so violence in the real world uh, and that's when our partnerships with um the with the authorities can be really important so they and we have the kind of relationship where they can say hey look there were this this is a particular flashpoint this particular religious holiday or religious uh, event which could lead to communal violence can you just be really ready for if we alert you to content that might be inflaming the situation so we will be we'll say absolutely we'll have, we have a dedicated team we'll say we'll make sure that they've got that they're on standby for that and then we can work really quickly to deal with that kind of content often we will find it ourselves so once you know we'll particularly say if there is a a um some v- content that might go viral we can uh, we can deal with that at scale so there are things that we can do but i, I think in general this is a whole of society issue um and um you know the 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 issue of polarization is obviously hu- a hugely significant one politically i think the evidence i want to say is really quite mixed uh we see some societies where they've got incredible penetration of the internet and social media which are less polarized than they've ever been and some which are more polarized so it's not obvious that 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 there's a causation what you what is clearly the case is if you've got a highly polarized society that is going to be represented online um and i think there's a therefore a a a, a kind of a, a partnership needed to see what we can do to try to alleviate the worst kind of consequences of a highly polarized society but also polarization could be something which is about hey we're having a really fierce pol- de- public debate about what's the right way forward for our country um and that should be something that people have it's a it's an incredibly important part of democracy and um so we we want to ensure that we enable that and we um uh, and we we don't stifle what is important po- in a public debate that's a incredibly important part of the role that we play is enabling that i think uh, how much time do you spend on meta <laughs> wow <laughs> uh it's an interesting one because i i mean i'm using uh, products kind of all day every day in mm. in many ways the whatsapp is my by far my uh the most um, uh, the product i use more than anything else uh to communicate with um my and my wife uh my uh my family back uh, in the uk my uh colleagues my old school friends like i might, might hopefully it's the same for you as well you've got some key groups that uh when you wake up in especially if you've got friends and or family overseas you wake up in the morning they're the first thing you go to find out what's going on as it happens my mum she's fine but she's been in hospital for a few days so I'm regularly checking in with my sisters and her as to how she's doing and funny story so my mum I said I was brought from Bradford in Yorkshire which has strong connections to Pakistan and um, she in she's in a small ward in hospital one of the other women in the ward with her her family are from Islamabad So that's just an amazing kind of coincidence that I happened to be here and shared with my mum that I'm here I sent sent to a live location and then she said oh one of the ladies in the ward is you know she's got family from from Islamabad so I just love WhatsApp for that 
for that private small group one-to-one -one communication but you know now i'm loving threads and if you're checking threads out i think it's uh, a wonderful space and uh, i'm particularly enjoying it seems almost every day there's more journalists who are joining threads and there's a real community of journalists uh, on there which i'm you know i'm not part of that community but uh, you know I'm fascinated by uh, by journalism, uh, 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 you know, around the world. So I'm I'm, I'm loving threads. And w how do you see the role of AI now? Because AI is also, at least in Pakistan, especially for the last two three years, sort of a very buzzword. You know, like as yeah. entrepreneurship or a startup was like a thing in, uh, in in Pakistan. Still now, obviously, we have seen the space, but the last two three years, I feel like you know, again because of the different factors, economy and politics. Uh, but generally, how do you see, one, the whole evolution of AI and then connecting that with all of these social platforms and the impact they can create in the long term? That is a massive topic, so let me try and uh, do it some justice. Um, so, uh, look, we think AI has the potential to transform uh, many of the ways in which we operate uh, from a society perspective and, and how we interact. And that includes our products. So the key thing with AI for us is we don't see it as something that's separate, right, to the the all the other products that we have as a company. We see it as completely integrated and something that which will be transformative for them over an extended period of time. Uh, and in some ways, for us, this is actually just a progression. So it's not like we just started doing our AI last year. Uh, a lot of the work we do in the background that you don't see, including how newsfeed works, uh, that is AI driven. That's not somebody saying, oh, I think what Tal Taha would like to see now is this, and I think you should see that. That, that's AI that drives drives that. AI is incredibly important for how our advertising uh, works, but you know, for large and small businesses all over the all, all over the world. Um, and also, we use AI to keep people safe. So um, we uh, we use AI to find bad content. Um, like say pornography, which we don't allow, uh, uh, that is taken down at enormous scale by AI, generally before anybody sees it. Um, so we've been using AI for a long time, but not in the foreground, if you like. It's not been something that you see when you're using our products. And now it is. So we've integrated Meta AI, and, and Pakistan is one of the first countries uh, to where people are seeing it. We, we're integrating it into the product, and we're seeing it as a way for people to create content for pe using the Imagine feature, for people to maybe improve some of their language. And that's both for people, you know, for, if, if, whether, if it's you doing it in, a, in your primary language or a secondary language, to say, oh, I just don't think I've written that quite right. I can use AI to improve it, uh, to get good information. So for instance, before I came here, I did think to myself, imagine if I had a few extra days where would I go? And I used Meta AI for that. I just you know, asked it the question. So instead of doing what we might normally do, which is go and use a search engine, where you'd get so many results and you think, I just don't know which one of those to, to actually explore, just use Meta AI. And uh, it, it gave me some great tips. It made me feel like, oh, I definitely should have stayed on longer. There's some great places to go to. And, and my team here say, Simon, next time you come, you at least have to go to Lahore and you need to go up north. Uh, you need to come for two weeks. So uh, I could use Meta AI for, for that. So there's a whole range of, of uses and there's gonna be so much more to come. Um, also internally, we use it within the company. Um, so for instance, one of the things we have to do as a policy team is write submissions to governments. When governments put out proposals for, for instance, new privacy laws as being considered here in Pakistan, they will uh, hopefully put out a draft uh, and enable us to comment on it. Um, when we do, Meta, uh, we, we use AI tools to actually uh, almost like produce a first draft uh, or to, when we've written a long draft and say, well, we need something much shorter, we can use AI to do that. So uh, there are all kinds of tools that are uh, available. And then what I think is much, much more exciting is what other people can do 
with our product. So we have this these Llama uh, models. Um, they are what's called open source. So anybody can access them, can download them, can use them to build their own AI-based um, products. And I was talking to you about this competition earlier. Um, one of the other um, uh, uh, finalists uh, was creating an AI, AI that could help people who were taking this English proficiency test. I can't remember the name of the acronym, but it's when if you want to get a scholarship to go and particularly say if you want to go and study elsewhere, you need to demonstrate your proficiency in English. Uh, it can be very expensive to get tutors to help you do this. They're, they're using AI to create an online free service to enable people to test their English, whether that's spoken English, written English, set them tests, et cetera, mark, the, mark it for them and give them tips to get up that level that you need to get up on, on your proficiency. So a great example of using a product that we've created, uh, which is genuinely designed to create an ecosystem of AI-based products, which are good for people and which people can use to improve their lives for fun um, uh, and, or to just make kind of ordinary everyday things more efficient. So I've talked to one of my friends that I will be sitting with you and he's a content creator. And the only, he said, I have only one question. Okay. When is uh, monetization is coming to Pakistan? I'm sure okay. you've heard that a lot. I have. Like what's stopping Meta to bring monetization to Pakistan? Because the creator economy is like huge in Pakistan. Um, so what's like, is there any plan? I can say there is, but I just want to be clear. This is not something where, as it were, we're just saying, oh, can't be bothered. Oh, it's only Pakistan, who cares? No, there's a real recognition that this is something which is, uh, we get asked about a lot. Uh, I'm glad you've asked me. Um, uh, there are some legal issues associated with it, which have been hard to figure out. But how do we actually do it here, given the way that the banking and legal system works? We are making progress, and we are hopeful uh, that we will be able to get there soon. So we will be able to launch monetization soon. So it's a work in progress. Uh, it is, yes, but it's a work that in progress, which is hopefully going to lead to a positive conclusion pretty soon. Also, can, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, how you guys are working with the creators? Because the creator economy, as we discussed, is quite huge and massively, you know, there is a lot of growth which we have seen. So is there like a particular program from Meta to work with the creators in Pakistan? So we do have uh, partnership teams uh, that uh, try and take opportunities to engage with creative communities, often with um, partners in, in, in the region. So I know that they have produced a podcast, uh, which is particularly targeted at uh, Pakistani creators, and we can share those details with you, so you can share it with your audience. Uh, I'd say that one of the other things we do is we really try to improve connectivity so that creators here in Pakistan can reach not only people here, but reach people around the world. So I'm uh, happy, to, happy to let you know that we are connecting a cable uh, early next year to Karachi, which is 45,000 kilometers long, called To Africa, which will connect Pakistan with 33 other countries and will improve connectivity here. Is so it the it's, internet or? It's our services. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, but this is similar. A lot of uh, the connectivity around the world of subsea cables is paid for by companies like us uh, to, in to ensure that our products work really well for the billions of people using our services. So that will help everybody in Pakistan, um, uh, providing that the, that, there are, that services are able to run freely here. Um, and that will include creators. So there, there are investments we are making in the connectivity infrastructure that support services like Instagram and Facebook um, and Threads and Meta AI uh, and Llama. All of these will get better as, once that cable lands and will improve Improve the the ecosystem, if you like, for for Pakistani creators to really ensure they distribute their content to, around the world. Can Can you tell a little bit more about this? So, sure. so there is this cable which is going to connect from Pakistan to Africa, that's Africa. So thirty three other countries okay. uh, in Africa and, and the Middle East. And so, this is a cable that goes all the way around Africa, and then connects back to the U.S. Um, but it's land. One of the landing points is in Karachi, and that's going to be in twenty twenty five. And how would that affect the user? Well, what it does is improve the the um, 
the the bandwidth, if you like, improves issues like latency, uh, improves connectivity. Now, we also rely on uh, uh, other people's networks within Pakistan, and we want to ensure that those are kind of are able to operate freely without interruption. That also matters. Um, but this will be hugely beneficial um, for people here, but also enormous numbers of people in, in Africa as well uh, and just connectivity in this region will be massively improved uh, because of that that investment. And how do you see the whole creator economy because before like if you go back let's say five to ten years uh, the brands were more into the scene you know like uh, publications like BuzzFeed and Vice as an example like we are TCM so we were like you know the publications were like more in front of that but now we have seen the the creators are sort of crossing that sort of race you know if you could say uh, how is the whole landscape changing well it's changing in in so many ways one of them is in terms of the formats that work best for creators and brands actually uh, re- we've seen enormous success of reels a huge growth uh, in the use of reels and that short form uh, video content uh, and the people who can create that sort of content and I, I imagine you you enjoy that kind of content I certainly do uh, and our ability to connect creators with people who enjoy their content and eventually monetization here. Uh, I think that's the sweet spot uh, for creators and and knowing that they can just reach so many people around the world who love that kind of their their kind of content. So uh, we we offer a just an incredible platform to do that. But short form content reels is is really where it's at. I think one of the question people or like especially from the creator economy if they're watching one question they would have is how to go viral on social media and especially on meta well i i think that is uh, that's maybe the 64 million dollar question really as to what is the kind of content look you need to understand your audience and we we provide all kinds of metrics to enable you to do that to know what works um you, and we use ai to do that uh, i think the uh, who knows what's going to be the next big thing uh, that people will enjoy watching. I mean, I've got this particular thing with this guy, Adam Rose, and his construction-based reels. I don't know if you've seen these. I love those, and therefore I get lots of them. Um, uh, but I'm also quite into my sport, uh, and and therefore I will often get reels associated with sport. But, you know, there's all kinds of different kinds of creators. I'm a dog owner, so some of the, the, the creators who are uh, creating content with golden doodles, we happen to have a golden doodle at, at home, love that uh, then anything involving Taylor Swift but you know there's only one Taylor Swift in the world <laughs> Simon thank you so much for taking the time out and uh, thank you for all the work you guys are doing in Pakistan I think it's a very important work uh, for the for, for overall for Pakistan especially for the young people I think so thank you for that thanks very much Talha I've really really enjoyed our conversation thank you very much